Good morning, Creeksiders, and others who've tuned in to worship with us this morning, albeit uh, digitally. We're, we're glad we've gathered together. And I want to mention just uh, one thing before we get started with our call to worship is that we are we are all waiting for the governor and for local officials to tell us when and in what way we can uh, gather physically. And so just know that we as a staff and elders are thinking through that. And one of the things that we're doing is we've uh, created a committee co-chaired by Mike Lazardo and Steve Gregg to, uh, to think through some of these things. We've got about 10 people from various perspectives in our church, men and women, to, to think that through. And so uh, just know we're, we're thinking that through and we're waiting and you'll receive more information about that on Monday through our email and through a Facebook Zoom meeting where you'll be able to, to ask some questions. Uh, that said, let's, let's hear God call us to worship from Psalm 117. And I'd maybe encourage you if you're uh, on a couch or a beanbag, or wherever it is, maybe just stand up now to, to hear this and to sing, recognizing we do worship with a heavenly throng and uh, all creatures before our great King. Psalm 117, praise the Lord, all nations, extol him, all peoples, for great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Let's do that now. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Worship His holy name Seen like never before Oh my soul I worship Your holy name The sun comes up Oh 
Well, if you've been around Creekside for a while, you know that one of the legacies that we have as a church is uh, just a long-standing history of training up the next generation of ministry leaders. One of the key ways we're doing this more recently is through our pastoral residency program. This morning, we get to hear uh, an update from actually our first pastoral resident, Mitch Cruitt, who is a lead pastor in the Clearwater area. And so we're just really grateful to get caught up on how he and Rebecca are doing. Creekside, um, enjoy this. This is a part of the fruit of your labors. Hello, Creekside. My name is Mitchell Cruitt. And not too long ago, I was a pastoral resident at Creekside. It's hard to believe, but I've now been the lead pastor of Northwood Community Church in Clearwater, Florida for the last eight months. Rebecca and I miss you dearly and continue to appreciate the love and support we experienced at Creekside during our time there. But we especially miss the Cunningham Banks One Another group and especially miss also the Creekside youth. Uh, we love y'all and would welcome a visit from y'all anytime after this uh, virus has passed. Uh, since we left Creekside, we have been on a roller coaster journey in Clearwater, but the Lord has been incredibly faithful to us through it all. The very first week uh, we were at Northwood, Rebecca had a miscarriage. We began the journey of grieving without having an established community to rely upon. Needless to say, that was incredibly difficult, especially when you add on top of that adjusting to a new role, in a new church, and in a new place. Yet the Lord was faithful through it and used that to establish a few friendships within the church and several for Rebecca through a Bible study she is a part of outside of the church. After that, we found ourselves in and out of the hospital, sick and bedridden, for several months. It took about three or four times of one of us getting sick before we finally realized it wasn't a coincidence. Each of these bouts of sickness had compromised our ability to do ministry. In some cases, we had to cancel our recently formed small group. At other times, it threatened my ability to faithfully preach and teach God's Word. Since then, it has seemed uh, two weeks can't go by without something else coming up that distracts us and threatens to take away our focus from the work that God has set before us, uh, including a global pandemic. I never would have thought uh, during my time in seminary or at Creekside that when I began serving as a lead pastor, one of the first things I'd have to do is lead our church through a global pandemic. It finally became clear to us after instance after instance came up, uh, distracting us, threatening the unity of our church, threatening my ability and our ability to do ministry together, that this was not mere circumstance, but a spiritual attack that threatened to distract us from the work God had given us to do. Yet through all of these things, including the coronavirus, the Lord has used these challenges and trials to deepen our dependence upon him through the word and prayer. And while it has been challenging, we've also had the great privilege of seeing the Spirit of God do a powerful work through the Word of God. Probably the most encouraging thing to me has been to see how God has worked through His Word. Since I've been at Northwood, we've done a sermon series through Colossians, Jonah, an Advent series in Isaiah, and now we're doing a sermon series through 1 Timothy. I've been in awe of how God people have responded to God's word. I've had the joy of seeing uh, people grow in their desire to see the supremacy of Christ in all of scripture. I've seen people grow in hope as they see how the gospel and the promise of Christ's return meets them in the midst of their suffering and brokenness. I've seen people begin to realize the depth of their brokenness and sin and find the courage to confess that sin to other brothers and sisters in Christ because of the hope and grace we find in Christ. And most recently, we've begun to see our congregation increasingly grow and in having a burden for reaching the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The adage is certainly true. God's word does the work. Right now, our elders are seeking clarity about who we are, what we'll do, and where God is leading us as a church. And as I've seen God be faithful to us in the midst of these challenges, all of this has reminded me to be patient and to, to depend on God, to let his word do the work, to lead us, to guide us, to challenge us, 
and to encourage us. As you think of us, here are a few things you can be praying for. Pray for me to have joy in Christ rooted in who he is and not in my circumstances. Second, please pray for Rebecca and I to continue to develop deep friendships with people both inside and outside our church where we can be honest about how we're doing. Third, uh, please pray for me and our elders to have wisdom and unity as we read together, pray together, and discuss together where God is leading us as a church. And finally, uh, please pray for Rebecca. We've recently found out that we're pregnant again, and we're so excited for another baby crew to join us this fall. Uh, please pray for the baby to be healthy and for Rebecca to retain all of her energy as she tries to uh, care for a toddler while being pregnant when we can't go anywhere. But anyway, Creekside, we love you, we miss you, and we hope you're well. Creekside, I hope you all are enduring this time of shelter in place and social isolation. I know in my house there's been a number of different changes that we've had to kind of learn together in this time. Uh, we've had to learn homeschooling, 
We've had to learn me working from home. That's a, a totally new thing for us. For a while there, we thought we were going to have to learn to find a suitable replacement to toilet paper. Thankfully, it hasn't come to that just yet. One of the big changes we've had to deal with in my house is the total absence of Major League Baseball. That's been a pretty big challenge for us. We're big baseball fans. If you are around Creekside, you're aware of that. Uh, this is the time of year when hope springs eternal, when we're all convinced our team still has a legitimate shot at winning the World Series. But there's no live baseball right now for us to watch. And so to, to deal with that in our house, what we've done is we've gone back and we've actually been re-watching the 2016 World Series. Now, if you don't know what's significant about the 2016 World Series, I am personally offended by that. 2016 is the year the Chicago Cubs, my favorite team, ended their 108-year championship drought and finally won the World Series. Now, I distinctly remember where I was as I watched each of those seven games. I was actually here in Gainesville in a little place we were renting before we moved into our house. I remember watching every single one of those seven games. I remember several different points in the series where I was convinced that the Cubs were going to lose the series. A decision was made by the manager or an error was made on the field. A loss was, uh, they had a loss at a certain point in the series where I felt pretty confident. There's no coming back from this. We, we've lost this series. Now what's interesting is, as I'm re-watching the series now with my family, we come to those moments where all hope seems lost and it seems like the series is over, and I'm experiencing those moments in a totally different way. It's the same loss, it's the same decision made by the manager, it's the same error on the field or strikeout or failure to get runners in, but I'm experiencing it in a totally different way. And the reason is simple, you know this and I know it too, when you know the end of the story, it changes the way you experience the rest of the story. When you know the end of the story, it changes the way you experience the rest of the story. You've experienced this. You've got a story that you love, whether it's a movie that you come to time and again, a show you've watched before, a book that you just can't get enough of. And the second time you've come back to that story, now that you know the end, all of the sudden little details that you didn't really notice before become really important. That character that you thought was really insignificant, you now know is anything but. And that moment where you thought that all hope was lost, that victory was out of the grasp of the main character, now serves just to make the true ending of the story even sweeter. Because knowing the end of the story changes the way we experience the rest of that story. And that got me to thinking, what if we could experience real life that way? What if our, our daily lives would present themselves to us as if they were a story we were reading for the second time? A, a movie we were watching where the ending had been spoiled for us. How would it change the way we live our daily lives if we knew the end of our story? And when we come to the passage we've arrived at today in our journey through this letter of Revelation, what we're going to find is exactly that, the way that the story ends. Now, if you're just joining us or if you just found our website and you're kind of looking for different church services to engage in, we're really glad that you're with us today. We are coming down towards the end of a series, walking through this letter of Revelation, this last book of the Bible. It's, it's really a letter written to seven churches in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, who are a group of people who have, become, who have come to believe one thing, that Jesus is the Son of God. And, and not only that he's the Son of God, that he is the King of an eternal kingdom that he is now bringing to earth. But the problem in the lives of, of these Christians who are receiving this letter is that for some time now, a rival kingdom has been kind of warring for their affections. It's the kingdom of Rome. And at this time, one of the most anti-Christian emperors is on the throne in Rome and he's putting all of his ingenuity, all of his weight, all of his power toward stamping out the Christian movement because he doesn't want anyone else to be called Lord except for himself. And at this moment, I'm just 
guessing, but I, I think it's a pretty good guess. At this moment, as Christians are watching their friends and family be persecuted, lose their jobs, lose their relationships, be arrested, be beaten publicly, in some cases even killed, I have to wonder if they're rethinking the way they thought the story was going to end. I have to wonder if they're thinking, well, now wait a minute, is our kingdom the one that's going to win? Because if it isn't, then we're enduring all of this pain kind of needlessly. And if our kingdom is not the kingdom that's going to win, we're probably saying no to certain pleasures or comforts in this life that we don't need to say no to. I mean, if our kingdom isn't going to win, then none of this is really worth it. And as these doubts are beginning to take hold in the minds and the hearts of some of these Christians, one day a letter shows up from a guy named John. This is the John that we know who is the author of one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He's written several other letters that we have in our New Testament. And one day John is in prayer, it's a Sunday, and he begins to receive a series of visions with the command to pass these on to these churches as an encouragement to endure in their faith in Jesus and in their trust that, in the end, the kingdom of Jesus is going to win. And after a series of visions, we come to the the set that we're going to look at today, which spoils the end of not just their story, not just our story, but the story of history itself. And it all starts in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. We, We read this, Then I saw, this is John speaking, I saw in his next vision, heaven opened, And behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it, is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, he judges and makes war. John goes on to give a series of descriptions of the one who's seated on this white horse. We can be sure, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that the one seated on this horse is Jesus. Primarily because all of these descriptions he gives us over the course of a whole paragraph match up with different ways Jesus has been described in different places in the letter of Revelation. Jesus has returned to earth, and John is watching it happen. And what we're going to see over the next several verses, I'm just going to summarize them for us here, but what we're going to see over the next several verses is that the return of Jesus in the end means the end for all of his enemies. The first two that are up, the first two enemies that Jesus is going to defeat at his return are two characters we met back in Revelation chapter 13, the beast and the false prophet. Remember, this is a a highly symbolic uh, set of visions, and so the, the beast and the false prophet, they symbolize two different spiritual forces in this world who are attacking the church and trying to detract from people who are not Christians choosing to become Christians. The beast is that spiritual force we met back in Revelation chapter 13, who tries to intimidate people away from following Jesus through the threat of pain and persecution. The the beast is at play in the the Roman policy towards Christianity right now that is causing so many of these Christians reading this letter to to watch as their friends and family and, and to watch as they themselves are suffering this threat of persecution and of loss. And the false prophet who works with the beast or works in tandem with the beast is that spiritual force that tries to seduce people away from following Jesus through the threat of a more pleasurable, more comfortable life than the one that Jesus can provide. When these two work in tandem, what we see is this kind of motto, avoid pain, embrace pleasure. Avoid pain, embrace pleasure. Avoid pain, embrace pleasure. This is the motto of the beast and the false prophet as they work together to destroy the church. Now, on the surface, we're like, well, what's wrong with a life with no pain and lots of pleasure? And and sure, maybe that would be a good life, but we know that much evil has been done in this world at the hands of the beast and the false prophet. How many lives have been ruined and destroyed by those who have used power and the threat of pain in order to get what they want out of those underneath their power? How many lives have been ruined by false promises of pleasure that have led to addictions that have destroyed families and marriages and really lives. See, these two 
these two enemies of Christ, the beast and the false prophet, they have brought about a lot of evil in this world. And who wouldn't want a world without the abuse of power and without the threat of pain and persecution as a means to get what somebody wants? Who wouldn't want a world without false promises of pleasure and comfort that lead to addiction, that lead to the destruction of homes and families and lives? And a world without those two things is exactly why Jesus came back. And when we see Jesus' return, we see that these two enemies are the first to go. Chapter 19, verse 20. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. These two, the beast and the false prophet, were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. That is a really important image for us to understand, in part because medieval art and medieval literature has done a lot more to shape our imagination about what this lake of fire is than the Bible has, I think. In, in the Bible, the idea of the lake of fire, it's a metaphor Jesus actually introduces. He uses the word, when he talks about it, he uses the word Gehenna, which refers to a valley, the Valley of Himon, which is right outside of Jerusalem. In Jesus' day, this valley serves as a dump. When people have excess garbage in their homes, they take it to Gehenna, and they throw it in the pile with the rest of the garbage, and there's kind of this ceaseless, ongoing fire that's burning this garbage at all times. And so, a picture of what eternity separated from God looks like for those who refuse to worship God is kind of like the experience of this garbage that is constantly, eternally being burned. But more significantly than that, this valley, many, many generations prior to the day of Jesus, was the place where the evil kings in Israel's history would bring out the children of Jerusalem to be sacrificed to false gods. Now, I don't know if it's because I'm a parent of two young boys, but I can't think of a more heinous act possible to be done to the vulnerable among us than to take children, to kill them, and to burn them in an act of worship to a God that doesn't even exist. So in the perfect justice of an infinitely just God, the acts that were perpetrated in the name of these two spiritual forces are the sentence that they now must face for eternity. The beast and the false prophet are the first two enemies to go because when Jesus returns in the end, it means the end for all of his enemies. Now as formidable as these two enemies are to Jesus and to his people, they're really just minions of the ringleader of the true enemy. And what we find as we continue through this passage is he's the one who's up next. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw, John says, an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit of, and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him. Now, the verses that follow talk about this period called a, a thousand years, or we refer to in our Christian circles as the millennium, and there's all sorts of ink spilled about this. And in fact, uh, last year when our lead pastor was out of the country, I actually preached a whole sermon dedicated to that one topic. So I'm not going to talk a lot about it right now. If you want to listen to that sermon, I'm going to put the link in the episode description of this video. And the point is that the next enemy in line who falls when Jesus returns, is this enemy who's described in a couple really key ways. The first is he's called the dragon. He's called that because in Revelation chapter 12, John saw him in his highly symbolic vision as a dragon who's trying to consume Jesus, and then after he fails to do so, tries to consume and destroy the church. But I think even more instructive for, instructive for us is the second description, the great ancient serpent. See, way back in Genesis chapter 3, the world is exactly as it should be. Human beings are working and serving God in the garden. They are enjoying a perfect relationship with him in his physical presence. And then a new character comes on the scene. It's a serpent. 
you know the story. He begins to tempt Eve essentially by saying this, Hey, Eve, you know how God says that if you do these things, it's bad for you and going to lead to death? And if you do only these things, that, that's what's good for you and leads to life? I don't think, this is what the serpent said, I'm paraphrasing. He said, I don't think we can trust God. Do you? I mean, how do we know he doesn't have ulterior motives? How do we know he's not just trying to keep us needlessly dependent on him? And, and here's what I think. This is the serpent still speaking. And here's what I think, Eve. I think you and Adam, I think you can do this yourselves. I think you can figure out what's right and what's wrong. I think you can figure out where to find meaning and purpose and abundant life without all the fuss of having to submit to and obey this God. And as that idea implants deep in their minds, a new world is introduced. A new normal is brought about in creation. A creation that doesn't function the way it was designed, but now is, is broken like a car that all the oil has been taken out of and then it's sent back out on the racetrack. Because of the deception of this serpent, a new world of pain and disease, injustice, anger, anxiety, depression, worry, doubt, fear, broken relationship, loss. A world where all these things are now the normal is introduced because of the work of this serpent. Let me ask you this question. Who wouldn't want a world without those things? Who wouldn't want a world that is totally absent the coronavirus or partisan bickering and divides? Who wouldn't want a world without pain, without injustice, without loss, without oppression, where the vulnerable are cared for rather than exploited? Who wouldn't want a world without that? And it's a world without that that brought Jesus back to this earth. And as we look a little further down in our passage, we see that this great serpent, enemy, this great adversary of God and his people is the next enemy to fall. Verse 10, And the devil, who had deceived all the nations into making war against God, was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever. For eternity, in, in the justice of this infinitely just God, for eternity, this great serpent, this great adversary is going to face what he has done to creation and to God's people for eternity. In the end, Jesus' return means the end for all of his enemies. And yet Paul has really something, something really interesting to say about the enemies of Jesus and the enemies of the church. The, the beast and the false prophet and even the dragon as, as formidable and, and, and insurmountable in some ways undefeatable enemies as they may seem. They're actually not the worst and last and greatest enemy. Paul tells us it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says, Jesus must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. In other words, until he's defeated every single one of his enemies. And the last enemy, verse 26, to be destroyed is death itself. See, Jesus, he defeats death in a way that you and I probably wouldn't expect death to be defeated. He defeats death by subjecting himself to it, by becoming a human and dying himself, but not staying dead. Because death, the last and greatest enemy of God and his people, cannot hold power over God himself. And so when Jesus rises from the grave the third day after his death, he deals death a mortal wound. And here in this passage, we see as death is finished off. Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. I'm not exactly sure what it looked like when John had these visions to watch as death itself, that thing that had claimed the lives of so many of his beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, the, the, one, the ones he was writing to or the ones who were left behind who had not yet been persecuted to the point of death. I, I wonder how John felt as he watched as the last and greatest enemy of God and his people is cast into the lake of fire forever. Who wouldn't want a world without that? Who wouldn't want a world where our loved ones don't die? 
where we no longer have to say goodbye, where we no longer have to feel that grief of they're not going to pick up the phone anymore or they're not going to be there when I ring the doorbell anymore. Who wouldn't want a world without death? And yet a world without death is exactly why Jesus came back. The last and the greatest enemy of God and his people is destroyed because Jesus' return in the end means the end for all of his enemies. We look at this passage and we see the end of the abuse of power, the false promise and seduction of what ultimately becomes addictive, fleeting pleasures, the great adversary and deceiver who brings about all the havoc in creation, death itself. When we look at the end of the story, we see every single one of these enemies lies defeated at the return of Jesus. But there's a catch. And the catch is, once these battles are over and these enemies are once for all defeated and cast into this lake of fire, a great ledger is opened. A ledger that holds all the deeds of all people who have ever lived, of yours and mine. And the question is going to be asked, whose side did you fight on? Way back when the end of the story wasn't clear, when which king is going to be victorious is a question that wasn't answered. Way back when it looked often like these enemies of Jesus were going to be the ones that were going to prevail. Here's the question, which side did you fight for? We see this happening in John's vision, chapter 20, verse 11. Then I saw, John says, a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. See, as exciting, joyful as it is to look forward to the day when all of these cosmic enemies of Jesus are defeated, the reality is once they're defeated, the books are open. And those who have fought on the side of these enemies have before them the same fate that these enemies have. And the really scary thing, which takes the end of the story from totally exciting to really scary, is that every single one of us has fought on the side of these enemies. Paul tells us in another place, Romans chapter 5, another letter that he wrote, that the reason death has reigned from the day of Adam until now is precisely because every single one of us has sinned. Every single one of us, to, to put it in the language of this vision, has fought on the side of the enemy and has given our allegiance and our trust to the enemy whose kingdoms we thought would prevail. So here's my question for you and the question that this passage puts before you. And if you went somewhere else to check your social media feed or to check your email or to get a quick news blast, come on back because this question I'm about to ask you is, try not to be too arrogant here, but it's the most important question anybody's going to ask you for a little while. Here it is. In the end, when the return of Jesus brings about the end of all of his enemies and this great cosmic ledger is opened with all of your deeds and all of my deeds written in it, and the question is posed, which side did you fight for? What's your hope? What hope do you have that when the ledger is opened and all of your deeds are laid bare with no spin or no arguments or no cross-examination, just the objective evidence, what hope do you have? This is what it means to have faith. See, we're putting our faith in something that on that day when the ledger is open, that there will be something that will allow us to pass through that judgment. Some of you may put your faith in good works. You're putting your faith in the hope that some sort of cosmic scale will be laid out. And if the good works you've done fighting for Jesus outweigh the bad works you've done fighting for his enemies, that you'll be allowed to pass through. Some of you are putting your hope in circumstances. Look, 
anybody who was dealt the hand I was dealt wouldn't have done as well as I did. Sure, I wasn't perfect, but nobody is. Some of you are putting your faith in the fact that this vision is not really how the story is going to end. That you don't really have a, a great day of final judgment ahead of you. And, and maybe you're right. Maybe you're right that this isn't a real thing or that you could skate through it on the back of your good works or some sort of bell curve grading system. But what if there's a better hope? What, what if there's a, a more sure way for you to know you can pass through this final judgment, despite what all the evidence says. Paul tells us exactly what that way is in Colossians chapter 2. He says this, And you who were dead in your trespasses. In other words, you who because of your sin has the same sentence of eternal death placed on you, as do the enemies of Christ. And you who were dead in your trespasses, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, or maybe a better translation is this he obliterated by nailing it to the cross. Here's the hope the Bible offers to you and to me as we face the idea of this final judgment where all the records and all the deeds are laid out objectively before us. The hope is that the evidence will have been destroyed because the sentence will have already been carried out. The hope that I have in facing this judgment is not that when the details are laid out that the good will outweigh the bad or that God will grade me on a curve because of my circumstances or or, or even that This is all just a myth and it's not going to happen. The hope that I have to pass through this final judgment is that somebody has passed through this judgment for me already. And that an infinitely and perfectly just God will never, ever, ever punish a sin twice. The hope that I have is that when my name appears in this cosmic ledger, there will be no evidence underneath it whatsoever that I have ever fought for a side other than Jesus because the evidence has been destroyed on the cross. I don't know what you're putting your hope in to pass through this final judgment, but I kind of think that that's a better hope than the one that you have. This is the great promise of Scripture. This is why Jesus came the first time to, to live a perfect life, the life you and I were supposed to live, to die the death that you and I should die, this death described to us here several different times in Revelation chapter 19 and 20, but then to come back alive again in the great and ultimate defeat of all of the enemies of God. So that's the end of the story. That's how all of history is going to wrap up. All of Jesus' enemies defeated. And one and last final judgment for all of us to endure. So now that you know the end of the story, and knowing the end of the story changes the way you experience the rest of the story, now that you know the end of the story, how are you going to experience the rest? Which kingdom are you going to align yourself with now that you know which kingdom wins in the end? This passage calls you, and I'm calling you right now, on the other side of this camera I'm staring at, to align yourself with Jesus by faith now. Because you know that in the end, the kingdom of Jesus will prevail. And it's not just what you've been saved from, but it's what you've been saved two, which is what we're going to talk about next week as we continue through our series. We're going to try something new here at Creekside because part of what we want to do is to make sure that we don't just preach these sermons and people kind of feel good and then go on about their lives as if nothing happened. We want to try to give you an opportunity to continue discussing this topic and this text. And so we're going to put out three, four questions each week to give you an opportunity around your lunch table or if you are in a small group here at Creekside to continue talking about this passage. I'm going to put it up on the screen now. I'll just highlight the first one. How do you react to the idea of a final judgment? Does it scare you? Do you find it offensive? Why do you react that way? I think that question will get some great conversation rolling. Creekside, the end of the story has been spoiled. We know who wins. So which side will you align yourself with now? How will you experience the rest of the story knowing 
that there, there is a sure way to pass through the judgment in the end because of a gracious and loving God who's paid the price for us. Knowing the end of the story changes the way we experience the rest of that story. And the end of this story, of all of history, is the return of Jesus, which means the end of all of his enemies. A world with no more pain, no more disease, no more loss, no more death, only the presence of God. Let me pray for us. Father God, we praise you because though we have fought for the enemy and though you would be perfectly just in leaving us to the life we deserve because of it and the death we deserve because of it, because of your grace and mercy and love for us, you have come in Jesus to make a way for us to pass through that judgment. Not to overlook sins, but to take the punishment for them on yourself so that we can be set free. What, what other God is there like you who would solve our separation through your own sacrifice? Father, as we look at the end of the story, it is my prayer and our prayer that having been reminded who wins, that we will remember that despite what the circumstances may say, hope is not lost, the battle is not over, the pain and the separation that we endure is not the end of our story. And I ask that even right now that you would bring about in those who are listening a new faith and a new trust in the hope that we have in Jesus alone so that in the end when the books are opened they will find their name as, as I will because of Jesus written in the book of life. And I will have before me an eternity in the presence of my Savior. Make it so for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Watch and pray, finding me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow.
faded all All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Jesus paid it all All to him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain he washed you white as snow. Creekside, hear this word as a benediction to our worship time this morning. From 1 Peter, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, Casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen.